Invité distingué, mesdames et messieurs, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Bonsoir et bienvenue au panel d'astronautes international de la 27e session du programme d'études spatiales de l'Université internationale de l'espace. Good evening and welcome, Huang Yin Guang Lin, to the International Astronaut Panel of the 27th session of the Space Studies Program of the International Space University. Je m'appelle David Kendall, je suis le directeur de la session et j'ai le privilège et l'honneur d'être votre maître de cérémonie ce soir. My name is David Kendall, the director of SSP 14, and I have the pleasure and honor to be your master of ceremonies this evening. The Space Studies Program 2014, known as SSP 14, opened on June the 9th in this splendid ICAO headquarters. Since then, the 122 participants from 30 countries have enjoyed four weeks of 57 core lectures from ISU's distinguished international faculty on every space-related subject from astrophysics to space law. They are now immersed in departmental projects which include visits to local aerospace industries such as MDA and Bombardier, as well as to the Canadian Space Agency headquarters in Saint-Hubert. They have had fascinating field trips such as to the Arctic Net Research Icebreaker, the CCGS Amundsen in Quebec City. In parallel, focused workshops are being conducted with world experts to reinforce the core lectures. Soon, the participants will begin probably the most intensive part of their program as they intensify their work on the four team projects dealing with exoplanets, health and space, space and open innovation, and autonomous missions for on-orbit servicing. As you can tell by the titles of these projects, they have the opportunity to work on and gain skills in a variety of different areas important in the global space endeavor. This amazingly rich program is made possible by the generosity of our sponsors and our two local hosts, HEC Montréal and École de Technologie Supérieure, ETS. We are privileged to have with us this evening the Director General of ETS, Monsieur Pierre Dumouchel, and the Director of HEC Montréal, Monsieur Michel Patry. And I would, would like you to join me in taking this opportunity to acknowledge their outstanding support for this session. As you enter this building, I am sure you are able to appreciate the excellence of the venue for this evening's event. This beautiful building designed by Montreal architect Dan Hagenau is the site of many of our activities. As an aside, the seats that you are sitting on have won awards. They were designed by well-known industrial designer Michel Dallaire. This outstanding, value, this, sorry, this outstanding venue has been made available to us by our host, HEC Montréal, the oldest business school in Canada and a school renowned for its openness to globalization and drive for innovation, both goals of the ISU. Our other local host is ETS, with its state-of-the-art campus located on the other side of the mountain at Peel Street and Notre Dame West. All of our core lectures and many other activities have and are being held there, including all the four team projects. ETS is the fourth largest engineering institution in Canada and globally recognized for its strong interaction with industry, including the local aerospace industries, again, making it a natural fit for the ISU program. Another major reason for the success of this year's program is the support provided by the Canadian Space Agency that has been opening its doors to the participants throughout the summer, as well as providing its experts to support many aspects of the academic program. 
We must also thank the Canadian Space Agency for sponsoring a live webcast of tonight's event. But tonight, tonight is what is traditionally considered to be the highlight of any SSP session, the International Astronaut Panel. And I must particularly thank our sponsors for this evening, United Technologies Corporation, MDA, and Investissement Quebec. Merci beaucoup. On behalf of John Connolly, the co-director of the program, and myself, we would like to say how lucky we feel to have with us tonight five amazingly accomplished women. Janet Petro will introduce the panelists, but first let me give you a short background <coughs> on our distinguished moderator. Janet Petro is the deputy director of NASA's John F. Kennedy Space Center in Florida. She shares responsibility with the center director in managing the Kennedy team, determining and implementing center policy and managing and executing Kennedy missions. She recently served a 12-month appointment at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. as the Deputy Associate Administrator and Acting Director for the Office of Evaluation. But before I turn over the rest of the evening to Janet, I would like to introduce Ms. Wang's translator, Mr. Xiao. And I would also like to welcome in the audience Mr. Yibing Deng, Director of the Astronaut Center of China. We are very proud to tell you that Mr. Deng is an alumnus of ISU 2006 held in Strasbourg, France. And also with us in the audience is Ms. Li He, Head of Foreign Affairs of the Astronaut Center of China. I will now hand over to Janet to moderate the panel and hope that you all enjoy this very special and unique evening. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. Um, can everybody hear me okay in the back? Um, all right, good. Um, so I'm very excited to be here this evening, and I would also like to add my thanks to our hosts and to the International Space University Space Study Program. To you guys, the uh, participants in that program, thank you for uh, coming this evening, and thank you to my panelists here, who I think are gonna give you a really engaging um, time tonight. Um, I, I'm sure the first thing that you noticed about this panel was, of course, that they were all astronauts, right? And then secondly, that they were all women. Um, but let me start with uh, just a couple of uh, facts. You know, there have been about 500 humans who have flown in space, and of that 500, only about 57 have been women. And so this is a very rare opportunity that we have this evening to have four distinguished uh, women of those 57 here. So I hope you guys are ready uh, and, and uh, have a lot of questions for them a little later on. You know, um, NASA elected its, uh, or selected its uh, last astronaut class um, about a year ago, or a little over a year ago, and nearly half of the, or exactly half of them were women. And um, you know, it hasn't always been that way in the United States and in the rest of the world. Um, that selection of that class with half women was the first time in history where there was an equal number of both men and women selected. Um, and it's pretty amazing when you think that nearly 50 years ago, uh, cosmonaut Valentino Tereshnikov lifted off in Vostok 6 to become the first woman in space. And when she returned to Earth, Life magazine declared that she orbits over the sex barrier. But you know, as we all know, despite what that headline said, that's not exactly what happened. Um, in my own country, uh, the United States, um, during the 1960s, which was a very liberal uh, period of time in our history, um, 13 U.S. female pilots were selected for an Air Force project. Um, that group passed all of the physical and psychological tests that were required of the Mercury 7 astronauts and were expected to receive further testing, which could have led to uh, spots in the astronaut training program. 
But um, days before that additional testing began, that opportunity was just um, quietly withdrawn, and it would be years before that opportunity presented itself again. In fact, it would be nearly two, dec two decades before Sally Ride became the first U.S. woman in space piloting the Space Shuttle Challenger in 1983. Her historic space flight took place more than 30 years ago, marking a turning point in NASA's history. Um, since her mission, 45 female U.S. astronauts have flown in space, along with 12 women representing other, uh, 12 other women representing Canada, China, Japan, India, and France, and then the first astronauts to ever fly in space representing the countries of Great Britain, Britain Iran, and South Korea were also women. Right now, women all over the world are training for future missions that could include conducting scientific experiments aboard um, the International or other space stations, mining an asteroid for uh, exotic minerals, taking that second giant leap onto the moon, or even preparing for a long duration trip to Mars. So times have really changed. So I'm gonna go through and introduce our panel members um, uh, for you first. Um, so please welcome our first panel member, representing the Canadian Space Agency, Julie Payette. She was born in, hold your applause. <laughs> She was born right here in Montreal, Quebec. She earned her bachelor's degree from the United World College of the Atlantic and Wales, a degree in engineering from McGill University in Montreal, and a master's in computer engineering from the University of Toronto. In June 1992, Ms. Piet was selected from 5,330 applicants to become one of four astronauts. She's a veteran of two space flights, STS-96 and STS-127, logging over 611 hours in space. Julie operated all three robotic arms during her missions. She expertly controlled the shuttle's Canada Arm, the International Space Station Canada Arm 2, and a special purpose Japanese arm on the Kibu module. Please help me welcome her. Next, we have Major Wang Yiping from the People's Republic of China. Born in Yanti, Shandong. <laughs> Born in Yanti, Shandong, China, the Major joined the university in 1997 and graduated as a first lieutenant and a pilot in the People's Liberation Army Air Force in 2001. Ms. Wang is the second female to be chosen to be a part of the Chinese astronaut program and the second Chinese woman to fly in space. She earned that honor when she became a member of the Shenzhou 10 crew, which docked with the Tiangong Space Station in 2013. While aboard the station, the major, excuse me, right, Yaping conducted scientific experiments and taught a physics lesson to Chinese students by live television broadcasts and so she's become China's first teacher in space. Please help me welcome her. Our next panel member, Soyun Yi. representing the Korean astronaut program. Soyeon was born and raised in South Korea. She earned her bachelor's and her master's degree in mechanics and her doctoral degree in biosystems at KAIST, Uni Kaist in South Korea. Ms. Uh, Yi was selected to the astronaut program in 2006 and her flights on the Soyuz TMA-12 and the Soyuz TMA-11 to the International Space Station made her the first South Korean in space. During her mission, Ms. Yi carried out 18 science experiments. She monitored the way changes in gravity and other environmental conditions altered the behavior of fruit flies, looked at the growth of plants in space, observed earth weather and the movement of dust storms across the planet, and also measured the noise levels aboard the International Space Station. Please help me uh, welcome Ms. Yi. 
Thank you. Our final panel member is from the United States, NASA astronaut Dr. Shannon Walker. <laughs> Shannon was born in Houston, Texas. She earned a bachelor's degree in physics and both, both a master's degree and a doctoral degree in space physics at Rice University in Texas. In 1995, she joined NASA as a civil servant and began working in the International Space Station program. Shannon moved to Moscow to work with the Russian Space Agency in the areas of avionics integration for the station. She was selected as an astronaut candidate in 2004 and began her training for long duration space flights. Shannon served as a flight engineer, a co-pilot of the Soyuz TMA-19 in 2010. Her entire mission lasted 163 days, 161 of them aboard the International Space Station. Please help me welcome Dr. Walker. So here's the format of the rest of the evening. We're going to give each of the panel members an opportunity to um, talk to you for a couple minutes. A couple have presentations. A couple will just be doing some um, talking. And then following um, each of the panel members talking, we're going to be um, uh, answering, they're going to be answering questions. And I'm told that you guys are a very shy group, so please, um, please give us some questions up here. Um, I think Eric is going to be collecting them. I think people are going to be writing them down on cards and somehow is going to come up here. Um, please uh, identify who the question is coming from. If you have a particular panel member you would like to ask a question, note that and then your question. And I know we have um, questions coming in from Facebook and Twitter and Google and so forth, so we're going to try to handle those and moderate them as best we can. So. Um, let me start with, uh, we're just going to go around here. Let me start with uh, Julie Payette, and she's going to talk a few minutes about her experiences. Merci, Janet. Thank you so much. Good evening. Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Bienvenue à Montréal. I have extraordinarily distinguished colleagues with me, so I will be brief so that we can hear from their extraordinary stories. We have people from Asia, but also uh, into different kind of space program because even though we're all the same when it comes to it, uh, our experiences are different and I'd like you to hear from that. But let me just make a comment about probability and statistics. When you have a dream, then people might encourage you to have that dream. People might discourage you to have that dream. But one thing is sure is that you can always pursue it in your heart or in your mind or in the choices you make in life. But there are times when there are those dreams when communicated don't necessarily sound reasonable. In the late 1960s and the early 1970s, America was sending people to the moon. And the entire world was fascinated, not just America. And there were people everywhere that were inspired. And uh, there were little girls sitting down on the floor of a gymnasium in their primary school watching as those mighty astronauts clad in spacesuit would walk to the rocket and then take off and then transit to the moon, land on the moon, walk on the moon, and oh, God Almighty, drive that lunar jeep out there. <laughs> then come back, parachute down, splash down in the ocean. I was watching that, I was nine years old, and I was absolutely amazed. I thought I could do this. I wanted to be the person in the spacesuit, flying a rocket, but more importantly, driving the jeep. <laughs> Since then, I've bought a Jeep, but that's about as close as I've been to that. I didn't even understand what they said, because when I grew up and I was nine years old, here in Montreal, this beautiful city, I was a girl, 
they were men. I was Canadian, they were American. There were test pilots in mighty military everything. Nobody in my family had ever been near an airplane, let alone inside one. And they spoke English. I spoke zero of that language. But they inspired. And I was very lucky, despite those disadvantages, to be born in a family that did not discourage me. Of course, when I said, hey, I'm going to become an astronaut en français, they would say, well, okay, fine. Well, what are you going to do about it? And what are you going to study? And, uh, and well, you better work for it. It turns out that you never know when an opportunity is coming to come your way. You never know when something that you really desire is going to be fulfilled. What you know is what you can control, your education, who you are as a person, as a citizen, as a member of a society. And that you can control. And then one day, you never know, an opportunity will come in front of you. And then that's when probability and statistics play. You might not think you will make it. I sure did not. There were people way more talented. One of them is sitting in this room than I was. But if you don't apply, and if you don't put your name down for something that you really truly believe in, then you have a 100% chance of not making it. If you do, then everything is possible, and even the earth can be at your feet. Thank you. Next, we're going to have Major Wang um, give her remarks. Hello, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Taiko Nat Wang Yaping. It's my great pleasure to have this opportunity to share my flight experience with you today. In May 2010, I was selected into Astronaut Center of China and became a member of Taiko Nat Corps. After over three years of training, I carried out the Shenzhou 10 mission with my crewmates Ni Hai Sheng and Zhang Xiaoguang from June 11 to 26, 2013. Shenzhou 10 is the longest mission in China up to now. In addition to the routine works, manual rendezvous and docking, space class, and more than 30 space experiments were conducted in this mission. During this mission, my major responsibility is space class and the daily care of the crew members. Of course, I'm also responsible for the routine spacecraft status monitoring, equipment operation, space experiment, and be capable of manual rendezvous and docking. The space class is the first educational application in China's human space program. This outreach activity is live broadcasted in China and all over the world. As the primary teacher of the space class, I spent 40 unforgettable minutes with over 60 million primary and middle school students and teachers from over 80,000 schools all over China on the three-kilometer 
300 kilometer Earth orbit. I demonstrated the microphysical phenomenon in microgravity and successfully conducted five small experiments on moment of objects and the liquid surface tension. We showed to the children the world we expressed in space. We opened a window for them and brought them in the space habitat built by Chinese people to express the miracle and beauty there. Okay, well, I will show you a video about the space class. This is ground classroom. Mm, look, <laughs> this is my powerful Kung Fu. <laughs> Math measurement. Pendulum demonstration. Demonstration. One is a spring top, the other is a static top. Mm, tastes good. <laughs> that is our drinking water in space. Water membrane demonstration. In space, without gravity, the surface tension of water will dominate. I pasted a Chinese knot on the surface. Water ball demonstration. An inverted image was formed. I injected red paint into the water ball. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Look at the gun. Okay, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Actually, when conducting experiments in space for the first time, I felt fresh, curious, and nervous, just like everyone else. Because we can't simulate the microgravity environment on the ground, all the phenomena were also seen and experienced by me for the first time.
Okay, and now I would like to share something after I returned to the earth. I received many letters from the children. Their words were very cute. One child said, Teacher Wang, I saw you sleeping in the sleeping bag like a walking sausage. So funny. <laughs> a child wrote to me, Teacher Wang, I saw you floating in Tiangong like a bird and like a kangaroo. <laughs> Another one wrote, Teacher Wang, you gave me a dream, and I'm slowly climbing to the top of a tree like a caterpillar. I believe one day I will climb up and like you, turn into a butterfly, fly to the sky, and realize my dream. Many children wrote at the end of their letters, I will study hard, and I want to be an astronaut in the future to explore beautiful space. I will be a useful person to our country and to our world. Every time I saw these words, I was deeply moved by their passion and felt the happiness and the delight. The feeling of opening a wonderful world and the dream for them is really great. Here, I want to send my special thanks to a person. She is the predecessor of space teacher, American astronaut, astronaut Miss Barbara Morgan. During Shenzhou Ten mission, she wrote me a letter, expressed her greetings, expectations, and encouragement. Receiving her blessings from space, my crewmates and I were rather happy. Someone has asked me, what is the meaning of women astronaut participating in space flight? I think without the participation of female, the human space mission is not complete, just like the meaning of a female to a family. She can take responsibilities, bring vitality to the crew, makes the series and the tough mission lively and harmonious. In addition, the participation of female makes it possible to study the physical and the psychological differences of male and female in space. Last but not the least, my body weight is less than the male astronauts and my economical could be another reason. <laughs> After Shenzhou Ten mission, many people call me a space teacher. This is a great honor to me, and I felt very proud of that. But comparing to the great space course, comparing with many of my workmates here today, Comparing with the predecessor of space exploration, I'm just a newcomer. There are many things that I should learn, and there is a long way in front of me. From the first flight of Taikonaut Yang Liwei to now, we have successfully implemented five manned space missions. From one person to mountain persons, from one day flight to mountain days, from IVA to EVA, from Shenzhou to Tiangong. Breakthroughs were made one by one, and the glories were created one after another. Peaceful utilization of outer space benefit the whole humankind is our dream and is the common will of the human being. Taikonaut is the peace and will flying into the space. There is a long way to go for China's human space program. It's also the same for the world human space exploration. We have to work hard and persistently on the basis of our pioneers. 
In the end, I would like to use a sentence in my space class to end this presentation. Space dream will never get weightless. Science dream has endless tension falls. Thanks again for the opportunity given to me by the ISU. Thank you all for this wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you, and now um, Soyeon Yi. Soyeon Yi. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I. My title is I sang in space, and then I prove that it's not a lie. I want to show one movie clip. Could oh, just no, could you? Fly me to the moon and let me play among these paths. Let me see what spring is like oh, to be the end of Yeah, I really did sing in space. <laughs> and space is quite amazing for me because I can sing there even. And one great privilege to be a woman astronaut is even if I don't say anything, everybody knows I'm in space. As you see that, uh, look at that. The guy astronaut, if you have only portrait, you cannot feel anything, yeah. But me, my ponytail is always hanging around. <laughs> So I don't have to any say anything, and then everybody knows me. I'm in space, and that was a huge privilege. And I really seriously thinking about to cut my hair like him because during the training, when you close the, your helmet, long hair is really dangerous because you don't have air tightening. So I'm thinking and thinking, and should I cut my hair? Because sometimes training was to stop because of my hair and then air leakage. And the instructor told me, and you should and then ha have your hair inside, and then please tight more tightly like that. But one American astronaut come to me and then told me, because you are the first Korean astronaut, please don't cut your hair. It's a great privilege of a woman. If you untie your hair in a space station, you don't have to say anything. Everybody knows you are in a space. <laughs> yeah, that was great privilege, and then first one. And then second one is, even if I became a first Korean astronaut, my daddy didn't excited it at all. And then my daddy sometimes even sigh. Because in a Korean culture, uh, when my daddy heard about astronaut program and then all the colleagues talking about astronaut program and then even some kind of conservative guy and then I don't wanna waste my tax and I don't like astronaut program. Even there's a woman astronaut candidate, but she should go back home and take care of the kids and cook for their family. I don't know why they are there like that. So my daddy cannot say anything because her daughter is in there. <laughs> yeah. and so he, he feels so proud of that, but he cannot say out loud to other people because all have a different kind of issue and different point of view. But one day, I met a Hillary Clinton in Korea, and then she came to the Korea, and she wanna meet me. I wonder why, because there was a bunch of astronauts in US already. 
So she come to me and in front of the TV camera, she said, I dreamed to be an astronaut. But when I was a middle school student and I went, knocked to the door in NASA and I asked them how I can be an astronaut, and then they answered like, you cannot be because you're a woman. We only pick the guys. So she decided to go to the law school. At that time, she told me, I don't know whether it is real or not because she's a politician. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, anyway, she talked like that, and then she shake hands with me, and then you made a dream that I cannot make it. And then all the Korean kids are clapping hands, and then everybody excited, and then finally my daddy excited, oh my god, you made a clear healing pen? Oh my god. <laughs> so that moment, yeah, I feel so happy to be a female astronaut, and I make my daddy excited. And then, he can proudly say, she is my daughter. Because all Korean guys also envy me to meet that huge politicians in Korea. Uh, yeah, everything's really great, and you already saw that space class, and then you heard about how can be an astronaut, how can be dreamed about to be an astronaut. I also, even my mom cannot go to the even middle school because of the conservative culture, and at that time, Many of the conservative uh, family in Korea doesn't allow two women to study more because if they are educated more than guys and they will not listen to their husband and there is typical culture. So my mom even cannot go to the middle school. But in 30 years, I became a doctor and I became a first Korean astronaut. So all the things changed. So those, my family background make me think about a lot of things in space. So when I look through the window and look down to the earth, and then accidentally and then suddenly I'm wondering why I was born in Korea, why I was born in my own family, and why I was born in 1970 rather than 1950. If I were born in 1950, maybe I could be killed because of the Korean War. And if I were born in 1940, maybe I even cannot go to middle school like my mom did. If I born in even 1980 or 1990, if I were born in Kenya or some ID or some other third world, maybe I even cannot get an education at all. But luckily, I was born in Korea with a good education program, and also born in 1990, uh, 1970 rather than 1900. So that, that was quite amazing, but I would never apply. I want to be a Korean person in 1970, yeah. Anybody apply for that? <laughs> no. So I think it's really unfair. What if the African kids who deliver water every day, they feel so unfair because if they were born in US, from the kind of average family, they don't have to deliver water, they can go to the school instead. So I realized that, oh my God, how blessed I am. It's really not fair. And I should be grateful, I should appreciate everything, and also to take care of the other peoples who were born in different time and in different place and in different kind of situation. And we should be obligated to take care of them and thinking about them and then do something for them. So there was big change of mind because before my flight, I thought like I'm quite miserable from poor family background doesn't have any good thing. All my friends went to other countries to study, supported by their parents, but I should take care of my even parents during my part-time job. And then I would never think it's grateful. But after my flight, oh my God, once I can have a part-time, once I can get an admission from school, once I can get a scholarship from government, and then that is amazing and a really lucky thing than other peoples. More than half of the Earth population have a really struggling to feed themselves even. So that was a huge part of my flight, and then after that, I did my best. Of course, I'm not that rich like uh, yeah, Steve Jobs or some other people, so I cannot give the food to them, but at least whatever I can do, I'd love to do something. And still, in Korea, a lot of debating about space technology, human space flight, and, and everything. So whenever I have a lecture for the public, I should talk about space technology. So I can skip something and then can talk that. And then space is everywhere, even if we cannot realize that. So sometimes I talk to the politician and who want to cut the budget about space things in Korea, and then 
he said, of course, and then you can go space, so you can be a beneficiary of the space uh, program, but for me, what can I do? I mean, what can I get from space technology? But he has a cell phone with a GPS on his pocket, and he watched the satellite TV on his home, and he had a really luxurious uh, tempur mattress in his home because he's a politician, and then yeah, he played golf with the great material and then titanium things, and then he has all the kind of Gore-Tex out, outfit for the skiing or mountain biking. So I um, keep talking about that space is not for only for Earth, and it's space for everybody, and then not only love, but also space is everywhere. Space actually is all around. And on top of that, that is my favorite words, from Tsiolkovsky, Russian scientist. He's a great guy and uh, one of my heroes, and he said that a planet is the cradle of humanity, but one cannot live in a cradle forever. And when I see that word before my flight, I cannot understand what it means. When? And then why Earth is the cradle of the humanity? And then why we shouldn't be in Earth forever? I love to be on the Earth comfortably because with the gravity, we can lie on the bed. With the gravity, we can walk more comfortably. And uh, on the gravity, on the ground, we don't have a lot of pocket on your trousers, yeah. So it's much better. But think about that. Alpinists who went to the Everest, why they went there, even if that high mountain is uncomfortable? And then some people's exploration in Amazon, Antarctic, why they are going? Because they want to challenge themselves to get a better situation, better technology. And then thinking about the baby in the cradle. Maybe cradle is the most comfortable place for whole life because you don't have to go to the toilet because mom changed your diaper in cradle. And then you don't have to walk because mom and daddy always feed you if you are in a cradle. Even your age, if you are in a cradle, maybe your mom thinks maybe you have some problem, medical problems, I should feed you. So cradle could be a most comfortable place for you. But you want to go to the toilet by yourself. You don't want to eat carrot if you don't like it. But if you are in credit, you should eat because mom give you. So we eat whatever I want to eat. And then we walk whatever, wherever we want to go. And you can come from all over 30 countries from your country to here. If you are in a cradle with very comfortably, you cannot come here. So to walk yourself, to feed yourself, to go to the toilet by yourself with a diaper, you should get out of the cradle, even if cradle is the most comfortable place. So for us, humanity, even if Earth is the most comfortable place, we should go out to develop ourselves and then to make our environment, our Earth, more comfortable, more convenient, and a better world to live, I believe. Thank you. And last, we have Shannon Walker. But not least, I hope. Not least, <laughs> absolutely. No, I'll actually keep this pretty short because I know people do have questions. And I want to echo some of what uh, the other panelists have said. Um, you just never know what life is going to present to you. Like Julie, I was uh, enamored by the space program. And I was extremely fortunate as well that I came from a family that didn't discourage me. They didn't bother to tell me at the time that girls could not be astronauts. Um, I was very lucky that I got to work at the Johnson Space Center right after school. Um, another thing that I think is, is very interesting is because I was chosen to fly on the Soyuz and not the space shuttle. I have not flown on the space shuttle, but I was chosen to be the co-pilot on the, on, the, on the Soyuz. And so like Yao Ping, I was trained in all the rendezvous and the, the launching and the dockings and all of that. And so I had more opportunities flying with the Russians than I did with the Americans because at that time only uh, military test pilots flew the co-pilot and the pilot on the shuttle. So um, you never know what life is going to present you. And also what I think is very interesting about this panel is because I've known Julie for years and years and years, and I've known Suyun for years. But when I really got to know Julie is when both of us were working in Russia. Um, we spent a lot of time together in, in about 1999, 2000, um, working in, in Russia. And then Su Young, I met her when we were both training for our space flights in Russia. And so it's um, such an international endeavor, uh, human spaceflight is. 
and it's, it's important that our countries continue to work together because um, that is the only way we're going to accomplish big things is to keep it international. Um, so that is all. Uh, we'll just go to the questions. Well, thank you. So I have a number of questions, and I'm not um, really sure uh, how new ones are going to come in. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the ones that I have. And this is from um, participant Yaz Yasna. Sorry if I don't have that uh, pronunciation uh, uh, correctly. Um, and the question is, how does mission control wake you up? So I assume you're looking at Shannon to answer that, or would you like them all? Let's start with Shannon. Well, it, it, it depends. Um, when we were flying on the shuttle, the Mission Control Center in Houston would play a song for the crew on the shuttle every day. On the space station, is much more mundane. I had an alarm on my watch. And so we just got up every day at the appointed time. No music for us. <laughs> so maybe we could hear from Major Wang uh, on what, how, do you, how do you get woken up uh, at the, in the space station? Shenzi. Wake up, in the morning. Wake up. Wake up call, oh. alarm song. Uh, to give my translator a job. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to uh, answer your question in Chinese. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Very good. Uh, 叫醒, <laughs> 是吧? <laughs> 是早上啊, 还是? <laughs> oh. Uh, uh, I don't know who asked this good question. I, I would like to answer this question. Who? <laughs> yes, no. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I would like to answer this question. We have a lot of people who have been in the past. 这次跟神舟九号任务有一个不同的地方，就是神舟九号任务，呃，我们每天都有一个值班员，呃，神神舟九号任务的时候，值班员晚上是不可以休息的。Okay, uh, uh, for the Shenzhou Ten mission where I fly, uh, the duration is fifteen days. The difference uh, between Shenzhou Ten and the Shenzhou Nine is that we have one person in Shenzhou Nine who is on duty who cannot sleep during during this time. 那我们这次神州十号任务有所改进，呃，每天我们晚上也会有一名值班员，但是值班员晚上是可以休息的。啊，in神州，in神州 ten, we also have one person in duty, but when he is in duty, uh, he can sleep or she can sleep. So that's the difference with Shenzhou ten. 嗯，呃，每天早上怎么醒过来呢？呃。这个问题呢，我们地面人员也想到了，所以说这次我们上去的时候，专门给我们派了一个闹钟，我们在上面可以定时到了时间以后，闹钟会响，就会把我们叫醒。So we have considered about that. We have an alarm clock. We set it, and then at the time, it will alarm us up. 如果到了时间，你睡得很香。if the alarm work doesn't work, can't wake you up. The ground control will wake you up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the next question is from participant Anna um, from the Netherlands, and I'm going to ask uh, Julie to answer this one, um, and it's how would you describe space to someone who hasn't been there? Thank you for the question. We fly nowadays 350 kilometers above the surface, or for those of you who are still in that old system, 220 miles above the surface. <laughs> And therefore, we see the planet in all its beauty. This is what is connecting us to why we're there and what we're doing. And the planet Earth, our home, our only place where we can live, 
the place we share, all of us, irrespective of where we're born or what we look like or what language we speak, looks like, would you agree, like a blue marble <laughs> in a backdrop of darkness. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely magnificent. <coughs> you cannot get tired. I only went to space twice on two short missions. Shannon can talk to us about being there a lot longer, half a year. You can never, ever, ever get tired at looking out. So space basically is reminding you about who you are and where you come from every minute of the space flight. Shani, you want to add something? Uh, well, I, I would agree. You can never get tired at uh, looking at the stars and looking at the Earth. And the, the depth of the colors are absolutely amazing. The pictures that you see from space are always very stunning. But what you actually see with your eyes is even more dramatic and more beautiful. And it's, um, it can be a very emotional event uh, looking out over the Earth when you're there and it's quiet. And maybe you've, you're by yourself in space and um, it, you just... It's just the wonder of it all, being there and realizing what we have achieved and how much we still have yet to achieve together. Sorry? Uh, can I see who asked this question? Oh, you can, Anna, yeah. And uh, who is your most favorite actor? John Hanks. Uh-huh. John Hanks. <laughs> OK. George Clooney? George Clooney? Mm. Yeah, George Clooney? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mine is George Clooney, yeah, right. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you have a really favorite actor. You believe that you cannot meet him, you cannot date with him at all. You always watch it through the TV and then on the screen, and then sometimes you have a poster in your room, and then sometimes your background desktop or your laptop, but still there. He's the same. He's that guy. And then when we were up there in a space, even before going to the space, in a simulator, we have uh, Earth yep. on the window. And we always see that. And then if you go to the Google Earth, you can see Earth exactly the same as we saw, right? Mm -hmm. But we are not that excited because it's a screen, because it's display, because it's a photo. <laughs> but once you meet the George Clooney in front of your face and he's breathing, <laughs> <laughs> he's alive. And then you could be freeze and cannot say anything. And even if you have a lot of questions on your mind, but once you meet him, your brain gone. <laughs> <laughs> because you are so nervous. Same as that, when you go up to the space, look through the window, Earth is alive. Over there like a Joji Clooney. <laughs> and I cannot breathe. Oh my God, that is the Earth. It's really exciting. <laughs> but you meet Joji Clooney every day. <laughs> Still exciting, but not as like first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so next one's from Tahir via Twitter, and um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Soyeon this as well. What is the one thing you would have done differently in training pre-flight? Ah. Cut your hair? Uh -huh. Cut your hair? No, no, no. <laughs> I will not cut at all. Okay. Yeah. Tra during the training, you mean? Yeah. In while you were um, the training leading up to your flight, what would yeah. you have been? What What one thing would you have done differently? Oh, actually. I was tried thinking it. about your entry coming back. Would you have done anything? Oh, uh -huh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I memorized more <laughs> everything because before my flight, I've never watched a movie Gravity. So I didn't prepare those, those situations. But, you know, when I watched the Gravity, movie Gravity, I couldn't watch the movie until the end because I would been already up there. And then that kind of accident is not a drama in a movie. It could be happened during my flight. And Sandra Block was luckily at the time she is doing EVA, so she could survive. But my mission was not an EVA. I should be inside of a station forever during my full whole flight. It means if we have those kind of accident, I could be killed. So after watching that freeze the astronaut in the shuttle. I couldn't watch a movie anymore after that. I, I, I'm really, literally trembling and have a really white face. My husband keeps asking, are you OK? Because, yeah, all the instructors, all the people, when I had a training, they told me you should prepare for everything. But 
whenever you drive safely, you couldn't think about accident at all. And then over, whenever you got a ticket, you're complaining. And then I'm driving very well. I can handle it, even 100 miles an hour. But once you have an accident, you feel so afraid. So something like that. So I should learning about ballistic reentry better because I already had a ballistic reentry. So now I know maybe I could have a ballistic reentry. And then maybe I should even drive Chinese capsule as Sandra Block did. <laughs> so maybe I could be more careful for the accident situation. Of course, at the time, I did my best to do that. But after knowing all those accidents, maybe I should more and more. Even I cannot sleep at all and then memorize everything, maybe. Yeah. Mm. Shannon, do you have anything to add, uh, being the, the long duration space I expert have a up here? Question. Um, our training program really prepares us really well for everything we do and the uh, emergency situations. I did try and learn everything, so <laughs> that was good. Um, and so I wouldn't say that I would really necessarily do anything different. I think maybe being my first time flying, uh, you are kind of nervous and you do try and learn everything. So if I have an opportunity to fly again, I think I would um, take time to enjoy the whole process more. Mm. Not okay. that I didn't enjoy it, but it was. Uh, so the next question is from um, Garner um, via Twitter. And the question is, what can we do to encourage more women to join the astronaut or taekwondo uh, core? Recruitment. Recruitment. <laughs> Any of you guys uh, want to take that? Uh, I, I don't want to you? push them to be an astronaut. But if there's any woman who want to be an astronaut, I want to encourage them. Because sometimes we want to inspire people to be some person, but mistakenly we push some other people so it's not good fit in. So I'm really happy to hear that a lot of opportunity over there for the women, and then more opportunity for other women. It's really good news. But sometimes I also watch some negative part because whenever you push some people to be somebody because it's good, but it's your eye and it's your standard, and then sometimes we push the wrong person to be in there. So those kind of booming always should be very careful to push the right person who can enjoy that job. Because if you push total opposite person to be a national, and then there's a lot of option and then opportunity for a woman. So how about to be a national, and maybe it's great for you. And then especially younger kids easy to be brainwashed, so they can be confused. If I really want to be an astronaut, or I'm pushed to be an astronaut because of the whole environment. And then many of the teenagers and kids are quite influenced by the environment. So, but after becoming an adult, they realize that it's good for my friends, but not good for me. But to be friends with them forever, I just went there, but it was the wrong way. So I'd love to support all the women and then all person who want to be really. And then if they can hear from their heart, they really want to be an engineer or a rocket scientist and astronaut. But I don't want to push the person who want to be an artist, singer, actress. They should be there to make us happier. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, so next question is from Erica of Belgium. Uh, via Google Hangout, and the question is, what is the main psychological differences between men and women astronauts? And so, well, anybody have a particular one? Why, Ping, would you like to take that? What's the <laughs> main psychological difference between men and women astronauts? Maturity. Taekwondo. Maturity. 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 <laughs> That's on Earth as well. Earth and space, nothing changed. I think that the space will not change if you are women. Everything will be the same. It will not decrease the difficulty, decrease the limits. 所以呢,在太空中,无论从生理上还是心理上,女性和男性同样要面临太空环境所带来的各种影响。比如说,失重环境, 
呃，所带来的呃肌肉萎缩、骨丢失等等。So,、uh, the space will exert the same、uh, physiological and the psychological stresses for men and women the, at the、uh, similarly.、Uh, for instance, the weightlessness will bring bone loss and and muscle atrophy. 呃，但是人类五十多年的载人航天历史证明，女性航天员和男性航天员一样，完全可以胜任太空中的各种生活，也完全能够适应太空中的生活。Uh, the last fifty years of human spaceflight experience has demonstrated that a female can completely uh, adapt to the space environment just like a man.、嗯、当然啊，呃，男女航天员还是有一些差别的。呃，比如说在体力方面，我们肯定是不如男性航天员。但是我觉得我们女性特有的认真、细腻、有韧劲儿，也是我们的优势。呃、uh, ，of course there are differences between male and female.、Uh, for instance,、uh, physiologically we are not、uh, strong enough, not、uh, have much strength uh, like uh, like female,、uh, like male. But、uh, we are more、uh, considerate, we are more、uh, serious. So there are the advantages of、uh, female. 嗯。呃，刚才我在报告里也给大家讲了，呃，当然我们的体重更轻，比男航天员更经济，也是一个比较重要的优势。<笑> so just as I mentioned in my in my presentation, that the females are more light than the males, that we are more economical. That is advantage for us. <笑><笑>、呃、所以呢，我觉得女性航天员和男性航天员一样，没有在心理上没有什么差别。I think there's no difference psychologically between male and female. Mm, thank you. So the next question from um, oh, from Ronnie, Ronnie、uh, on Twitter: How much freedom do you have to design or perform your own experiments? And I'm going to ask. Shannon,、uh, since you were a long duration, yeah, were you long able to duration, do a、um, very little. In in certain sense, we,、uh, for the most part, execute whatever flight program that the ground has designed for us. Now we do have opportunities on the weekends in our spare time to do our own experiments and do things similar things to、uh, what you saw in Yaping's、um, um, presentation. But by and large. The vast majority of our time is spent doing the experiments that the ground has, has decided needs to fly. All right. Anybody have anything else they want to add?、Uh, Soyeon, did you want to add anything about、uh, your experiments? At some point, I feel like maybe I'm a kind of like a robot from the scientist who designed the experiment from the ground, and then maybe I maybe I could better body to adapt to the space station, and then maybe. I could be handle a lot of things than all the scientists on the ground, maybe. But in same time, they cannot estimate all the problem during the experiment. So we can have some kind of freedom to modify it and then to fix it, to change because we are the person who observe what's going on over there. So all the things going very well as they planned. Maybe we don't have that much freedom, but. Once something happened and some kind of problems, and then we should do our best to fix it and then to make better results for them because we are representative of them. But it's very ironical when I had a training. All the Russian people are waiting for the accident because they want to show that how good they are, <laughs> and then they can do, have more freedom because mission control cannot do anything when they have unexpected accident. So. It's very interesting feeling whenever you face an experiment, and then in some part of your brain, wish it to go very well, <laughs> and then all the things will be over early, and then I can look through the window more. But another part thing, can I please make some kind of accident? I can do something more freer and then interesting things, and then maybe I can give you a great result to write the paper on the science or nature. So always, two things are. Going around, I think. Yeah. Okay. Next questions from、uh, Hilda, USA, a participant here in SSP.、Um, her question is: Tell us some of the fears you overcame and how you did it. So, anybody have a fear they want to talk about and how they overcame it? 
Did you have a fear? Did I have a fear? Uh, speaking Russian in public, that is really hard. For me. <laughs> <laughs> so you just overcome that by doing it. I think of most fears that you may encounter, because some of the training is, is very daunting when you first do it. Some of it is very physically challenging, but you like all fears to overcome them, you just have to do it and sometimes do it several times before you're comfortable. So you just have to confront them and face what you're afraid of. Yeah, I told, I told you and before and we talking about that and I didn't, I couldn't feel any fear during the launch and then until the docking and everything. But once I got a moji <laughs> Cause of the policy re-entry and then cause of a problem during my landing, I feel a little afraid and scared. But my colleague Yuri Malenchenko and then <laughs> Peggy Wilson, they are all experienced and then they are all quite stubborn, calm person and then they are not that expressive person. So even if you have a red alert and a policy re-entry, but Yuri looks quite okay and then Looks like nothing happened. Yeah. <laughs> and then Peggy also just doing her work. And she didn't express anything. So I feel like, oh my god, I'm that immature. And then it feels like I'm the three-year-old kid with the parents. <laughs> so to be a grown-up, at least I should be pretend to be OK. <laughs> but it rocks. Because if you smile, you can be happy. Sometimes, even if you cannot feel happy, but you're trying to make even a fake smile, you can feel happy. So at that time, after doing that, I feel so calm, and I can trust them, and they look like they can handle it, and I also feel confident to handle it, so that was great help. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so the next question uh, is from Karina, a participant from Algeria. Uh, what was your biggest challenge in the pursuit of your goals? Julie, you want to handle that one? I'm trying to think. <laughs> biggest Doubt. challenge. Uh, there, there's many challenges in, in anything, in any pursuit, this particular pursuit, because there's many of us that would like those seeds um, and few seats right now. Um, clearly then the challenges is heightened by that. I would say that uh, uh, I'm, I'm Canadian. Uh, we're only eight astronauts that have flown in space and we've mentioned also that out of the 57 Seven. women that have flown in space in the history of human space flight, only 12 came from different country than the United States of America, I would say doubt, uh, downplayed, not taken seriously all the time, all along until, whoops, you would outperform in the simulator and you'd be given the flight engineer job on the space shuttle or you would be uh, at the control of robotic arms or at uh, a flight engineer on the Soyuz, it, it just took a lot more time to convince that you were there to do just this competence job. And, but the good thing about it is that with perseverance, hard work, humility, and a lot of help from a lot of folks, uh, you can always make it. Nothing is complicated as rocket science. And fortunately, astronaut is not rocket science. We're not <laughs> the one inventing the rocket. So it's, uh, it's doable. So for me, I would say that was the hardest. I found that I was struggling into convincing other people that I could just do my job. Mm -hmm. Well, more often than I spend. If, so I wish and I hope for the future that there will be enough uh, number to start with, but a lot of diversity, such that uh, being different is not going to be looked at as suspicious, and certainly if you have long yeah. <laughs> curly hair, but it's not a factor. It's completely secondary. Well, thank you. All right, next question uh, we have from Tim. 
uh, via Twitter, and the question is, will my eight-year-old son live to see a human base on Mars? We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. Yeah, I think, I think there's a very good chance, but again, it's going to have to be in an international endeavor, and so um, as long as our countries continue to work together, I think that's a very real possibility. Um, politics can be a strange thing, um, and so often it can, it can scuttle the best plans, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident that an eight-year-old today will, will see people living on Mars. I'm hoping that when that person does that, it will, uh, it will uh, walk on the surface of the red planet uh, uh, for all human beings and not just a particular nation. Yes, yes. International. <laughs> Next question from Sylvia via Twitter. Uh, what's it like to experience gravity after being in microgravity? Um, Shannon, you probably have the biggest uh, yeah, uh, experience with that. It's interesting. It's, um, it definitely gets your attention. Um, <laughs> you are incredibly heavy. Uh, your inner ear is very confused, and so you can be very dizzy. Um, and uh, it's exhausting. Um, after being on, space, on the space station for six months and then coming back um, on the Soyuz, which is a lot more dynamic than the shuttle, and hitting the ground, which is definitely like a car wreck. Um, it's exhausting, mm -hmm. I'll say, but good. Any of you other ladies want to add to that, what it feels like going from microgravity to gravity? Uh, in the space shuttle, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm the only one that's flown the space shuttle here. Right. Uh, in the cockpit, you have a dial, which is the, the G dial, and of course it's pegged at zero the entire mission. And you're very comfortable, once you adapt to weightlessness, you're very comfortable there. But as you strap in, uh, the entry for the space shuttle is about a 40 minute uh, procedure from the time you deorbit over the Indian Ocean and the time you land at the mighty Kennedy Sen <laughs> Space Center in Florida, it takes about 40 minutes. And then during that time, that peg starts moving from the zero. And you're there strapped in with your space suit, which weighs about 100 pounds, and, and you're looking at this, and by the time it reaches 0.5, which takes a while, 10, 15 minutes, you're like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> that's way <laughs> enough gravity, because everything is just this is so heavy, and we all agreed that 0.75 was just like, oh, God. And as we turn around to line up for the runway for the space shuttle uh, to land on, uh, we actually go peg at 1.1 G, and it's horribly, horribly heavy. <laughs> so it's, it's very interesting. We don't realize it, but we live in a gravity, gra gravitational field, and we don't realize how extraordinarily <laughs> how heavy of, we are. Of what a force it is. It, you need to go away to realize that. And I guess we've all had different experiences. I don't know um, how many Gs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Ping got in. When I come in on the, on the Soyuz, normally we get about four and a half Gs, and of course, Su Young had a ballistic entry, which was <laughs> at least twice that, so. Um, but I'm okay. But you're, we're okay. I'm we're all strong, strong enough. Yeah. We're all strong. <laughs> Even if all the Russian guys worried about small Asian women, yeah. but I was strong <laughs> 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 Uh, oh, you also 4G, so yeah, almost similar with the Soyuz, yeah. right? So yeah. about the same. And here yeah. I am complaining about, about 1.1. 1. <laughs> 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 the one thing that was very funny, um, Shannon mentioned, and we all, uh, it's amazing that the human body can change completely in the weightlessness yeah. environment to adapt to that environment and then change completely again when you come back. And it takes very much few days. Whether you go five days, 10 days, 160 days, you still have some changes, and one of them is into the inner ear, which uh, basically either shuts down or stops spend, uh, sending uh, data to the brain, or the brain stops Listening. processing that data, whatever the reason is, it's not working anymore. So when you come back on the ground, we all suffer from orthostatic intolerance, but also from a lack of equilibrium, because our inner ear, who's telling us where vertical is, is not functioning normally. 
So uh, NASA, and I'm sure in China uh, and in Russia, they make you do all kinds of little tricks where you walk in a line and turn a corner, and you can't do that properly. We're also forbidden from driving a car for several days so that we get our equilibrium back. But the problem is that at the time, I had a six-year-old son who's somewhere in the room, but he's not six anymore. And he had not seen me for a while because I had been gone for 16 days uh -huh. in space. And then before that, several quarantines. We took five scrubs before we launched uh, in Florida. And he absolutely wanted to jump on me. And I'm oh. like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't touch mama. Because if you do, you would be pushed and you would just, just fall over because you have no sense down. of equilibrium. <laughs> and little you know, atrophy in the muscles. But fortunately, it's, it's the beauty of the human body, is it adapts, adapts again, and readapts. Mm -hmm, yep. mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Mm. Nice. All right, next question from uh, Daniel uh, via Twitter. And the question is, did any special laws have to be enacted to allow women to go to space in your country? And so I think all of us could, uh, all the panelists could answer that. Again, did any special laws have to be enacted to allow women to go to space in your country? Shannon? I don't, I don't, you may have to help me. I don't think we had any special laws. We just had a change in attitudes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, don't think, I don't think so. We don't have any special law. Thank God I have my own flight after much westernized from the Korean countries. So we didn't have any special law enacted but some kind of resistance because all the old guy people, they believe their first astronaut should be a military guy, not a woman <laughs> from the civil kind of part. But we don't have any, it, it was not illegal. Yeah, it was. Yeah, in in China, there's no restrictions for, men, for, for females to participate to be an astronaut. There's no such restrictions. Uh, uh,但是我想每个国家在选拔上肯定都有自己的方法和标准。呃,比如说,在我们中国啊,选拔我们这批航天员的时候,呃,有其中一个硬性条件是必须是结婚,已婚才可以选拔为航天员。So uh, there's a uh, of course, we have the standards, selection standards for different countries or for different agencies. In China, we have, uh, when I was uh, selected into the technology corps, there's one, one standard that is, uh, she, or she must be married. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, if Su Yan is uh, a Chinese nationality at that time, unfortunately, she cannot be selected because she is single at that time. Uh,女航天员选拔呢,我们当时选拔的时候会有一些,呃,各方面的条件,比如说,基本条件,呃,还有医学,心理方面,基本条件呢,主要包括你的身高啊,体重啊,年龄,还有飞行时间,以及知识
Uh, so either guys or women, and if they are not married, they cannot go to. I uh, cannot be a national, right? Yeah. Ooh. Must marry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Interesting. It's fair. Yeah. <laughs> it's fair. Feel more comfortable. <laughs> Julie, any uh, laws in Canada? No, no laws in Canada. Uh, however, I would, I would put one uh, for, for, you know, laws in space. We have uh, several um, space laws uh, experts in Montreal, especially uh, from McGill University. But I'd put the law that, uh, the, that uh, 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 my second flight, I have to put it in premise. My second flight, uh, I went, uh, it was a construction mission to the International Space Station. So the Space Shuttle Endeavour left with seven people on board to dock to the International Space Station, which had six people on board. So for a total of seven plus six, 13. Seven people on board the shuttle was me and six American gentlemen. And on board the space station were six gentlemen. So there was uh, a lot of gentlemen on that mission. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> and I would enact a law uh, if, uh, you know, that uh, gentlemen are absolutely, completely forbidden from stealing food <laughs> from the lady. <laughs> I agree. Because they do. Exactly. <laughs> I would dutifully rehydrate my lunch in the morning. Mm -hmm go and do whatever was on my flight schedule, and then I'd come back to the little uh, uh, oven, it's a convection oven in the space shuttle where you put your rehydrate and put it in there, and by the time it's time for lunch, it's all nice and warm and ready to, to eat, and guess what? My color was gone, and nobody knew <laughs> what happened to it. <laughs> Alien? Alien. Alien, Alien. 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 Yeah. And yet you still call them gentlemen, so good for I, I you. do, because you see it happens to be that mission control and the mission planners, especially on short, very intense mission of construction, every minute is calculated um, because we want to maximize the thing. So uh, I was a flight engineer on this mission. Uh, so with the pilot and the commander, we're the ones that fly the vehicle. And if we're not flying the vehicle, we were robotics uh, people. However, because of that, we're often very busy during the day and every day on the space shuttle and on the space station and any spacecraft, you have to, ma uh, to maintain the spacecraft. The most important, of course, is the circulation of air and the air you breathe with because you're in an enclosed compartment. Um, we have to go and clean the cabin filter every day. So somebody was put on duty every day to take out the vacuum cleaner and to go and clean the cabin filter where the intake of air. And uh, I take much pride to say that in my entire 15 days mission with 12 other guys, I was never assigned to the vacuum <laughs> To do the vacuuming. Good for you. OK. Oh, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't decide that. OK, next question from Tian Tian uh, from China uh, via Google Plus. Um, for any of you, or maybe all of you, how do you keep your personal privacy in space? Yeah, that's, it's hard. It can be hard, and, and you have to um, afford everybody their own privacy. And so when I was on space station, we were fortunate that we had our own crew quarters. We had six people and six crew quarters. So you had a place that you could retreat to and you had your own laptop to check your email or, or call home or call family and friends. And so you had a little space on the shuttle um, that's quite different. You, you just have to give other people their privacy so that they give you your privacy. Yeah, and on the Soyuz, not a whole lot of privacy on the Soyuz. <laughs> yeah, literally, we touch each other, yes. so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my case also in the Soyuz, it doesn't have any privacy at all, mm -hmm. and then feel a little uncomfortable whenever I want to go to the toilet, yeah. and then we only have a one kind of hatch, one hatch but we cannot close completely, right. just to hide. So feel a little, at first, I feel a little nervous to use the toilet because everybody knows that I'm doing toilet. Yeah, because and you have to, yeah, everybody You should turn on the motor, and then everything's the running, is. and then... Yeah. <laughs> so it was quite hard and I was quite lucky during my flight because most of the flight participants like me 
they cannot have a cabin at all. So we should sleep any walls and mm -hmm. any ceiling and then like that. But I flew up to the space station with the two Russian guys. And in Russian compartment, only two cabin over there. But before our arriving, there was only one Russian guy up there. So he, he is using one cabin, and then another cabin was empty. But two guys up there. So who can use the, that one left cabin? So Yuri Malenchenko, our commander, to make fair, Soyan, you can use it. <laughs> because the old two Russian guys are sleeping in ATV and in some other place. So luckily, my for whole 10 days, I have my own cabin. And then I have my a little privacy in there and I put my family picture on top of that and then I can write down my own journal and then doing some kind of uh, listening some music in there. Never ever bored to look through the window because in my cabin I have a small window right beside my and face. You, said you had your own cabin as well, right? For yes, yeah, we had our own yeah. yeah, station, yeah. right? On the station, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. How, okay. How's her privacy? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Look at her. We are going to talk about the fact that the person who is a man is a man who 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 is a man we, we, we have a different uh, requirements. Uh, for instance, we use the, using the toilet. Mm-hmm.比如说你要上厕所，或者是要洗澡的话，我们通常都是在轨道舱里进行这些事情。那这个时候我们会把这个会有一个小布帘儿，呃，把布帘儿挡上，然后再把这个轨道舱的舱门放
good part and bad part. For, first, their nation as an astronaut has a lot of good things, but in the same time, a lot of uncomfortable things always happen. But they always advise me and then talk with us, and then we can have a huge network to talk to other person whenever I need help. So that was quite good opportunity for us. I'd like to echo what Shannon said about the fact that with the International Space Station, when you think about it, the International Space Station will go down in history, mm -hmm. I am certain, as, uh, as an, an extraordinary feat of human beings who decided in the late 90s to construct an outpost in a very harsh environment of space and lower Earth orbit, and they decided to do that with many nations together. Japan, Russia, the United States, all the European countries, and ESA and Canada. So they put their brains, their resource, their budget, and their heart into doing it. And this is the first time that human beings have done that in order to advance their knowledge and to work together. So in 500 years from now, they will teach in history books how successful a foreign policy tool and a a di an international diplomatic outpost it has been. So it gave us the really, really, really lucky people that have been given the chance to fly uh, in the, on the ISS to interact with each other. So we meet people from all these nations and we interact in different languages spoken on the space station. I would say that we have to continue to embrace mm -hmm. even more nation mm -hmm. into such an endeavor because it's an endeavor that surpasses borders and frontier. And I must say I am very honored today to have a chance Absolutely. to meet mm -hmm. a Chinese mm -hmm. counterpart, a uh, female counterpart for, for the first time in my career. And, mm -hmm. and I hope there will be a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question is from um, Chris of uh, 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 United Kingdom via Twitter. And this is to uh, Soyun. Uh, what is it like going to the space studies program after being an astronaut? Ah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm so honored to be here as the alumni of ISU, <laughs> as well as the first Korean astronaut. It, it was quite interesting experience in ISU, actually. And then as I heard from so many ISU staff, I'm the first students of ISU who've already flown before <laughs> joined there. All, all ISU, uh, many of ISU alumni become astronaut after that, after their program, but I became ISU alumni after. But being an astronaut is a little different recognition between the person who already very well known about space and the person who doesn't have any idea about space field at all. So, for example, five years old, seven years old kids, they believe astronaut knows everything. So whenever I have a public lecture, small kids raise their hands and ask me about total complex astronomics because <laughs> they believe that I know every single stars and every single universe and everything. But it's very confusing for me because if I told them, even if I'm an astronaut, I had no idea about your question, and that make them so disappointed. But in the same time, I cannot lie, <laughs> even if I have no idea about that. So I realized that to be a good example for them and then to be a right astronaut to inspire kids, at least I should know just a little about space more than before. Even if I was a scientist astronaut, just to handle with a space experiment, but at least I should know about some common sense about space technology and then physics and then astronautics and everything. That's because I decided to join ISU. And then even ISU classmates have a bias that I know everything, even if I have no idea. <laughs> so in a class, I really feel tough because I had no idea about satellite. I, before being an astronaut, I was a researcher in micro machine to develop a machine for separating DNA. So small world, not the space. But when I learn about satellite application and all the terminologies are Greek to me, and then I had no idea, but all my classmates said, isn't it easy for you because you're an astronaut? Right. So, <laughs> but for me, it was a great chance to be in a SSP because I got to know 
very wide knowledge of our space technology. It's not a deep inside, but it's a good opportunity. And then when I was working in a Korean space agency, I really feel tough to work with the diplomacy guy, politician, government officer who doesn't have any idea about space or engineering technology at all. But once they know about just a brief and an introduction about all the things, maybe they can help us more efficiently. So I strongly recommend to my friends who want to be a leader in engineering, science, and space, I push them to learn about those things. And then you can have some clue about space, and then you can be a better manager. You can be a better leader. And then I think SSP program is a perfect program for a person who want to be a leader in a space field, even if they want to be a good leader in a satellite application, once they should be a leader of the whole space technology in their whole, whole country, then they should understand not only rocket, but also astronomy and everything. One, one day, if they will be a head of the agency or executive member of the company, they should cover everything about space. So SSP cover whole space things, and then help me a lot. Of course, all over the world, you can have a friends, from the 30 country, you have a friends. So wherever you travel, you can have a close friends to help each other. And then whenever you want to have a collaboration, something like that. And then so far, we, all of us, feel sorry about that. And we could have a close collaboration between China and other country. But a lot of Chinese colleagues here and alumni, look at Dan. And he's a proud ISU alumni, became a head of some part in Chinese space agency. And then one day, Maybe we can make a collaboration in the future, even if some other old people cannot make it. So I have a quite passionate about future collaboration, and then maybe ISU change the whole world to work together. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is from Andre of uh, Hangouts. Uh, question is, do you feel your presence on board made the crew more psychologically balanced? <laughs> so 12 to 1, Julie, you want to be the first one to start with that, to balance them out? <laughs> Somebody raise hands. Maybe he's the person who asked question. Thank you. <laughs> Probably. I, you know, it's, it's hard for me to answer since I don't often get into the heads of males and I don't know how they view the world. So, um, <laughs> actually, I was very fortunate when I was there um, for about four months. I had another female astronaut with me, so we were um, almost half the crew. So, I, I think we were pretty balanced, mm -hmm. yeah. I had a really great memory about female crew and when we had a winter survival training. Uh -huh. And then there's a several groups have a winter survival training together. But my crew who had a winter survival training with me, they are starting worried because they have a woman crew to make a shelter, mm -hmm. to cut the tree, and then all the things are very manly job and then big huge muscles are helpful like that. So two Russian guys, they just sigh because they realize that they will have one female crew instead of the guy crew. So I couldn't read their face, even if they didn't say about that. And then, but it was very interesting. And all the Russian guys between team, they com compete each other because yeah. they want to be a primary crew. And all they uh, doesn't have any assigned their flight. So they should be better than others to fly earlier than others. So they maybe blame me if we will not be very well as a team. So I also worried about that. What if I disturb them to be a primary crew? Hmm. But it was quite interesting. And then survival kit only have a one soul, mm -hmm. only have a one Caesar, and they always have a one. Yeah. So even if we have a three strong guys, only one guy can cut the tree. Yes. <laughs> so I got to know that. <laughs> And once they start cut, cut the tree, I praising him. Oh my God, you are great. You are strong. <laughs> <laughs> you are the strongest guy in the world that ever I met. <laughs> so he cut the tree much faster than other guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and after 
cut the tree, we should tie, and we should cut the parachute mm -hmm. to make a shelter and everything. But most of the guy crew, they just cut tree first and then think about that. Yeah. What should we do next? <laughs> because they are very high temper. Yeah. But when the guys cut the tree and then <laughs> digging the snow, I have nothing. So I just cut the parachute. I, I cut the, all the kind of thread mm -hmm. to be prepared. So it will be more efficient. So our team build our shelter a little earlier than other teams. And then finally, at the end of the survival training, I met the psychologist, very old psychologist yes, in Russia. Very old Russian. And then <laughs> he told me, I'm so proud of you because you show that female crew is really necessary because yes. you make them laugh, you make them happy, and you are well prepared than other guys. So it's really efficient as a team. Even if as an individual, I'm not that efficient like a guys, but as a team, we are quite efficient than other teams. So I feel so happy mm -hmm. at the time. So maybe being, <laughs> having at least one woman crew, maybe especially prettier woman can make other guys <laughs> more excited. <laughs> but in the same time, not too much pretty because yeah, if they are hyper excited, they are useless. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe one balanced woman is, or more than one yeah. balanced woman, quite helpful, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Anyone else wanna? No. Uh, we Chinese have a saying called "man and woman work together." There's a Chinese saying that is. Uh, when men and women work together, they will both not feel tired when they are working. So the, the female in space is just like a female in the family. It's indispensable. 嗯，他不仅承担责任，更让严肃紧张的任务变得生动而又和谐。Not only take take responsibilities, but also make the group um, um, brings them more vitality, make them happy, and more harmonious. 嗯，而且我觉得，呃，女性航天员上天呢，更有利于深入的研究男女航天员在太空中生理啊、心理等方面的差别和变化。so it's good for study the difference between males and the females, their changes in space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so next uh, question is from uh, Ian of the UK. Uh, and his question is, based on your experience, does a long duration mission to Mars strike you as a large problem? Anybody want to comment on that? Well, let's see. There's a lot of a lot to overcome going to Mars, and there's technological issues. Um, there are medical issues, and so currently, where we are today, I would say yes, going to Mars and a large, long mission to Mars is a big problem. It's it's a lot to overcome, but. I think we're on a good path to accomplish that, but it's not something that can be taken lightly at all. Now, if you uh, have put your name down uh, to go to Mars on that one-way trip in 10 years from now, um, it'd be interesting to see if uh, you'll get there up in space transit to the planet. The technological <clears throat> aspect of getting there, landing, let alone surviving on the planet, when, is so important at this time that within a decade, uh, uh, that is very, very unlikely. So I'm fascinated that, uh, that there is so many, such a, a, a strong interest right now and there's not more skepticism, particularly in the media, mm -hmm. about the fact that uh, it is a very complicated endeavor. We will, one day, somebody will walk on the surface of Mars, but I don't think it's going to be through a reality TV show in a <laughs> no, decade from now. It will not be through a reality TV show, but it is interesting that 
like you say, in the media, there's not a whole lot of skepticism. It's the obvious thing that we have to do. It is the human spirit. We are explorers, and we want to go mm -hmm. farther and beyond. And it's, and it's what we as a people throughout the world want to do. Okay, I'm told this is the uh, last question. Um, this is from uh, Suba, uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly, India. And the question is, what is the most important to have in a difficult situation? A sense of humor, confidence, belief in crew members, or something else? All of it. I would say all of that, yeah. plus and training. knowledge. Yeah, training. Na yeah. Knowledge, training. Knowledge. No, all of that's equally important. Yeah. Well, Ping, did you want to? Yeah. The same important. <laughs> what was that? Say the, the Most equally, important impo thing. E equally important. Equally important. We violently agree. Ah. <laughs> Good thing. So, uh, I'm told that was last question, but I'm going to ask one more. And <laughs> since I have the mic. <laughs> um, and let me see, it's from uh, La Fletcher, uh, and it's for Miss Payette. As a music fan, what terrestrial music means the universe to you? What terrestrial music? What terrestrial music means the universe to you? Oh. <laughs> All right, if you want to think about that. No, uh, <laughs> question. I, I must say that uh, listening to music in space, watching when you have a bit of a quiet moment. Uh, again, I was on construction mission. We didn't have quiet moment, lots of people on board. But we did have a little bit, especially on the, at night just before going to bed. We all went to bed at the same time and woke up at the same time eight hours later. So uh, this is when I would have this absolute treat, which is to float to a window, to look out, to see the earth passing by, and then put in your iPhone or your music, and, and to listen to that. And uh, I had this one blissful moment. Uh, I had several, but where we uh, crossed straight down the uh, peninsula of Italy, so straight down the boot, S from north to south, listening to, and if you don't know this piece, called uh, Handel's Dixit Dominus, and there is a duet by two sopranos in there called uh, Di Torrente di Via, the most beautiful music ever written. So I was, did I say I was in space station with nine gentlemen? Yeah. We weren't allowed to listen to our music because there was lots of us, especially in the space, it was a very crammed area. So we weren't allowed to listen to our music on the speakers unless we were on the bike doing our exercise. <laughs> so um, I, uh, my colleagues, whenever they were on the bike doing the exercise, had their music and then I would put mine and then all fly back to the space station because most of it was either French Canadian music or uh, Edith Piaf or <laughs> classical. <laughs> No, I had not. So uh, listening to, to music in space is, uh, and, uh, and classical music is, is like a blessing. Oh, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we all help me give me a large hand of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janet, very much for moderating this uh, remarkable panel. And to all of our panelists, so uh, a heartfelt uh, appreciation. So once again, Shannon Walker. <laughs> Su Yon Yi. <laughs> Wang Yaping. Julie Payette. And of course, our remarkable moderator, Janet Petro.
I think it would be um, remiss of me not to mention one person who isn't here who effectively thought about this panel and put it together. That is the, another remarkable woman, the Dean of ISU, Angie Buckley. She's not here, but please give her. And before closing, on behalf of the ISU, I would like to present each of our panelists and our moderator a very small souvenir, hoping that it might remind each of them of this extraordinary evening. So, Finally, um, I would like to invite all of you, as you exit the amphitheater at the back, uh, to join us in a reception that is hosted through the generosity of our sponsors, United Technologies Corporation, MDA, and Investissement Quebec. Uh, again, merci beaucoup. Thank you all for attending.